Most of us never learned how to train our brains, which is why most of us needlessly settle, struggle, and worse, suffer. My name is Chris Doris, and I want to make brain training mainstream. This is my series, Tough Talks, Conversations on Mental Toughness. I'm interviewing badasses from all walks of life on what mental toughness means to them and their unique approaches to strengthening their minds. Hey everybody, welcome back to Tough Talks, Conversations on Mental Toughness. I am your host, Chris Doris, and our guest today, his name is David Wood. David was recommended actually by uh, one of our former guests, Stephen McGee. And uh, you, can, you can count on the fact that if Stephen McGee is recommending somebody for, as a Tough Talks guest, then this is gonna be a, this is gonna be a potent and a uh, good time. A, a powerful and valuable dialogue is ensuing here, folks. So let me let me read a little bit of, of uh, David's bio. David plays for real. That's actually his company is Play for Real. Play for Real Life is his website. So David plays for real. He's a former consulting actuary to Fortune 100 companies such as Sony, Pro- Procter and Gamble, and Exxon. So he left his cushy Park Avenue job 20 years ago to explore both the outer world and his own inner world. David says, when you're 10,000 feet above the Himalayas, hanging from a piece of cloth, you see life differently. We're going to have to ask him to elaborate upon that. I'm presuming he's either a paraglider or a hang glider or something like that. But I want to hear all about that, so we'll, we'll, we'll uh, check in with him on that. From his unique vantage point, David has now coached thousands of hours, spanning 20 years in 12 countries around the globe. At the individual level, he helps high-performing entre- arch- entrepreneurs executives and leaders to play for real in their own growth, in their relationships, and at work. By integrating the principles of real truth, real daring, and real caring. So truth, daring, and caring, they become the leaders they themselves would follow. So we're definitely going to ask him to please elaborate on that real truth, real daring, and real caring. And at the corporate level, he helps companies improve performance and retention, of course, using the same methodologies. Play for real is something we all get to define for ourselves. To David, it means living with even more truth, more daring, and more caring than he has ever before. The real question is, what will real playing for real mean to you? Well, let's find out how to answer that question for ourselves. David is here. Let's go find him. And here he is, David Wood. David, thank you so much for making time today. How are you? Thank you, Chris. I'm good. I'm good. I'm glad I wasn't fully prepped for this so I can be more spontaneous because we you know, we had a little scheduling mix up. So I am now ready and available for us to say profound things. Amen to that. Well, then let's rock and roll, man. So you and I were introduced by a former guest of mine, Stephen McGee, who's a, who we both agree is, is a, an amazing human. Um, but you and I have spoken for probably a, um, a total of maybe four and a half minutes. So we haven't really met. We just talked yesterday for a second, testing out our, our technology here. But I really studied your your uh, stuff, your website in particular, and it's and it's pretty impre- it's amazing actually, and and I have some questions that, that to help us get started uh, in in our conversation today. And the first thing is, and I'm, I'm I'm amazed that I'd never heard this before, and this is astounding. You say in one of your videos on your website that ninety percent of people die with regret. That's a that's amazing in a, in a sad as hell way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know that 87.7% of statistics are made up. <laughs> <laughs> That's a joke. That's great. I have no hard data on this and I don't think anybody does because when you Google it, you find there's a nurse, Bonnie, someone um, wrote a book, the regrets of the dying. Hmm. And she, uh, she she talked to people as they're as they're passing and she put it into a book what she found and that's the book that everybody quotes what is the book uh i think it's called uh, five regrets of the dying or, or something like that okay and right. i have i haven't read that that book but whenever you look for information when you look for data when i want to get some hard research on what are the top regrets and what happens there's nothing out there like no one's doing studies on this but i think it's generally accepted that when we are on our deathbed, for most of us, there's going to be stuff that we wish we'd done. There's going to be mistakes we wish we hadn't made. And my job, my mission is to have us live now so that 
those regrets are minimized. Yeah, right. So hence the name of your company, Play For Real. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I love yeah, that. I, so tell us I about believe, that. I, well, I, I believe that life is a game. I've always been into play. Yeah. But I don't mean play in just a frivolous uh uh, frolicking down the sidewalk and through the flowers sense. I mean, life is the ultimate game there is. And if it is a game, if we do accept that viewpoint, then wouldn't you want to play the best game you can? Mm. Yeah. Now, not everyone thinks games, uh, life's a game. There's some people say, Oh, well, no, you know, I just lost, I lost a child uh, a couple of years ago. That's not a game. Mm. Well, I would, I would counter that it's a game where the stakes are high. Wow. Okay. A, a game, the definition of a game is over there is better than over here. That's how you define a game. And we have that in life. We want more money. We want deeper connection with our partner. We want a deeper sense of fulfillment. That's a game. So let's play. Don't take it too seriously. We want to be in a state of flow. But let's play for real as if it really matters uh, how we play the game. Wow. That's so funny because I actually recorded an interview uh, yesterday with another guest named Dr. Fred Blum. And he said the exact same, he gave me the exact same definition of a game. Interesting. Yeah, it is very interesting. Yeah. yeah I'm having a little deja vu over here. So yeah. another thing that you'd mentioned that really got my attention in, on your website or actually in one of your videos was that there are three keys to high performance in life and work. And I, I'd really love to go slowly through them. Okay. Because I, I, you know, I, I, um, I think that there's incredible symmetry between uh, the work that you're doing and the work that I do. And, and, and this is really exciting to me because I think that we use different language about some of the same stuff. And, that, and, and by virtue of that, I think that's going to be, this conversation will be really uh, valuable for the, the folks that are watching and or listening. So could you tell us about that? The three keys to high performance in life and work. Well, I can, I can only speak from my experience and uh, the experience of my, my clients. And yeah. I've probably coached a couple of thousand people by now. And what I found when I looked back at my values and I looked back at what made my life better, the ultimate thing is connection. Mm. I think if we don't have connection with our family, our friends, our coworkers, and ourself, then life's pretty meaningless. So the ultimate thing I discovered is we're really after deeper connection to have a more fulfilling life and to even to have business success, you want deeper connection. Now, how do you get to deeper connection? The three values that I've found are more truth which speaks to authenticity and integrity, more daring, which is about our courage and the risks that we take, and more caring, oh. which is how well do we nurture ourselves, our relationships, and our, um, and our, and our business. So can we go through those? Please. Yeah, perfect. So, uh, so more truth now, and, and you articulated it slightly differently, when you said real promises I think in one of the videos, but it's the same thing. Promises. I, I, well, I I'm think sure. promises is a subset. It's a part of truth. <clears throat> so in my life, when I'm willing to risk more by revealing more, and I think, you know, mental toughness is, is, is really the core of, of your podcast. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that yeah, is. It's this is tough talks conversations on mental toughness. That's right. Yeah, and I, I was, I've been thinking about it since our conversation yesterday, and I wonder if vulnerability is the new toughness. <laughs> Interesting. So I find when I'm willing to reveal my fears and my desires and be more honest with people and have more truth, mm. it's a risk. Yes. It's a risk. Yes. I might lose the relationship. They might go, whoa, dude, you're, you're too intense. And they're gone. Mm -hmm. But other people say, oh, I like this. I like that you're telling me that you're scared right now. I like that you're telling me straight up that you want my business and you'll, you'll do what it takes. So I find when I take a risk and I reveal more, I get deeper connection with the people that I'm meant to be connecting with. 
and I sometimes lose the people that I shouldn't be connecting with. So, so that is, um, that sounds really, it could, that, like it could be totally contrary to a lot of the conditioned beliefs, right, that, that we've picked up along the way about, like from the scarcity mentality about avoiding offending, avoiding, um, well, managing other people's impressions of you. The yeah. Thing, right? all, how many messages all of us have been bombarded with through the duration of our lives about how fucking important it is, is to manage other people's opinions of us. That's right. I'll give you an example. I coached a client yesterday and he wants some money from a company. They owe him they owe him money and he wants more work from them. So he doesn't want to rock the boat, <laughs> but he really needs the cash this week yeah. and they're a week late. So he's in this dilemma. Do I, do I speak the truth and take a risk and say, I actually need the cash. Can you make it happen today? Or does he play small and hide who he really is? and just hope that the money's going to come eventually and that he'll get more work with this company that he's not being totally honest with. So, so, so I hear maybe two things and clarify for me that there's two things that maybe he's scared of. One is um, that it might be embarrassing to say to this company that he needs the money. Yep. And two, pissing them off. So they'd say, get out of here, man. We're not doing any more work. Yeah. You're too much work, you know, chill. Right. That, that could happen. Have you ever worried that you're too much for somebody? Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. So, 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 okay, go ahead, please go. So I, you know, I didn't tell him uh, what to do. That's not my job, but I right. helped him look at, does he want a relationship with this company that could continue to go in that fashion where they're constantly paying him late or does he want to speak his truth and just say, Hey, the fact is I could really use the cash and uh, what can we do to make it happen today? And I find that often when I speak my truth, regardless of the results I get, I feel better about myself. I like myself more because I've spoken the truth and I've gone for what I want. And that's really what I want for people. The results we get are a bonus. The fact that he, I think he's getting paid today, yeah. that's a bonus. I want him to feel good about himself by being himself. Yeah. So, you know, as you're speaking, I'm thinking that um, th there's, there's may maybe uh, several levels to um, the ability to even speak your truth. And what we're discussing now is courage. But even before the courage, it's like you have to even know what the hell your truth is. Right. We, we're so, you know, I've been raised um, by society, I think, to be so conditioned to not even, not even be aware of some of my desires mm. that I might have that, that, uh, might be risky or say I'm dating a woman. There might be things that, that, that I want sensually or sexually that I'm like, I don't even want to think about them because you can't speak them. Or with my boss, there might be things I just know it, it might be an issue if I speak up. So you're right. Identifying really what is my truth is probably the, the first and most important thing I can do with my clients. Let's at least find out what that is. Then you can decide if you're willing to take a risk and speak it. Mm, wow. So can you, can you tell us a little bit about how, like the how, the mechanics of how a person becomes, whether it's how you help your clients or it's how any of us uh, become conscious of what our truth is because, um, because it is buried, right? Beneath layers of conditioned beliefs. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, like that it's important to be appropriate. Right. <laughs> right. It's whatever that means. It's important to be, um, Politically correct, right? Yep. Yeah. That was so conditioned. How do we know what the real truth is underneath? Um, I, I find often when I ask, like when the client's talking to me, say yesterday, he's telling me about this situation. I mm. can hear the truth because he's not worried about telling me. So he's telling me I need cash, but I don't want to tell them that. I want it today, but I don't want to rock the boat. So the truth is coming out often when you're speaking to a third party, like it could be a coach or a therapist or maybe even a friend, it comes out and hopefully they can hear that and parrot it back to you so that you can, so that you can get it. And another way, uh, a lot of people use journaling to write down, you know, and in the journal, you're often willing to tell the journal if you do speak consciousness, you're eventually your truth. So you, so, oh, that's really fascinating. So like if someone doesn't have a coach, then they could at least use, at least use paper, yep. <laughs> right? As a sort of a surrogate coach. 
So yeah. because, because there's no one listening to it. So you're saying that's an effective way to just write down, just write whatever you're experiencing, right? And, and then, and hopefully from that, you can discover what it is that uh, you're afraid of. Yes. And I've used the Byron Katie, uh, the work of Byron Katie a lot. I spend a lot of time with Katie and I use it with my clients. And she has a sheet called Judge Your Neighbor. And you can download it uh, for free on the internet and you pick someone that you've got. You say it's called Judge Your Neighbor? Judge Your Neighbor, yeah. And you'll pick somebody that you're having an issue with and you'll write down all your judgments and your, and your thoughts and it can help you identify what you're really thinking. Now, I don't know if I'd call this your truth, but let's call it a preliminary truth. That's at least what you're believing and what's going on in your head. And then she has a process that um, I find very powerful for busting open those negative, those negative beliefs. You said, I want to get back to Byron Katie, cause you mentioned in an email exchange, you and I had <clears> that <throat> you spent a month with her. I really want to hear about that, but I don't want to interrupt where we're at right now. We're, you know, we're talking about truth, daring and caring. Well, yeah. We're at, you were at truth and you mentioned promises. I think promises is a really fun subset of truth. If you're going to, when, when we speak in our society, we don't actually take ourselves seriously. We say, I'll, 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 I'll see you at seven. The way, the way it works is we don't really mean that. We mean I'll head towards that. And if, if, if that happens, it'll be amazing. But we kind of, um, we don't take ourselves that seriously. Even if we say, I'm going to go to the gym on Thursday, we don't really mean it. So we don't hold ourselves accountable to what we say. And often, um, if I, if I make a promise to you, say, I say, all right, you know, let's, let's talk at 12. This is a business setting. So it's a bit different. A lot of people show up right at 12, but a lot of people come at 10 past. They just got, uh, sorry, I got caught up. Right. Yeah. No, oh, yeah. fine. It's working. It works in our society. But generally I find if someone, if I make a promise to someone, if I say something and then I don't do it, they trust me less. They trust me a little less Amen. And, yeah. and I trust myself a little less. So wouldn't it be wonderful if we all started noticing what we say? Uh, I'm leading a training tomorrow for a company in, in Geneva about noticing what we say and being more careful with it and saying, I'll see you around seven or I'm going to aim for seven. But if you say, I'll see you at seven, play a game called getting there at seven o'clock and you know, set your alarms. I, my phone doesn't go off with an alarm at six o'clock. There's no way I'm getting there by seven. Hmm. So that's real promises is, uh, is a way you can play with being more truthful. And I just think it, not because it's right or it's moral, just because I find it works better that I like myself more and others like me more if what I say actually happens. I, so that's a, that's a huge clarification that you just made, not because it's like moral, <clears throat> right? I don't want to, uh, I don't want to make and keep my promises uh, because I should. <laughs> right. Right. Be but it's because I'm more powerful. You're reminding me of a couple of things as you're speaking about this. And one is Don Miguel Ruiz in his book, The Four Agreements. Mm -hmm. And one of the agreements is be impeccable with your word. Mm -hmm. And another is some work that I did with a former coach of mine whose name is Steve Hardison, who is Mr. Integrity. You're reminding me, this is, this is we're, we're talking about integrity. Yep. Is doing what you said you're going to do is keeping your promises or keeping your word. And he said, and he says that there is no, there's no contract on the planet stronger than a person's word. Right. And again, it's not important to, to keep your word out of obligation. That's not the point that you just made. It's because we're much more effective. Yeah. I, I've been spending the last 20, 30 years trying to step out of right and wrong. Step mm. out of this is the way you should do it, or this is the moral point of view. I, I think that's a load of crap, actually. Mm. <laughs> good. I'm more interested in what's workable, what has us have a really good life. And I've found that more truth leads me to more connection and me liking myself more. So I, I espouse that and I encourage people in that direction wherever I can. I love that. So let's go to number two daring, <laughs> more daring. Yeah. Yeah. And this ties in nicely with truth because it takes daring to tell your truth. Mm -hmm. So I was at a, I was at a retreat 
uh, last year. And I, I noticed after the retreat that I took four big risks. Uh, one of them was to tell a woman that I was, I was, uh, I was interested in her and to ask her out on a date. I asked her if she wanted to go to Colombia with me. That was a, that's a hell big, of a date. Yeah. That's a solid date. That was a big risk. Um, <laughs> I also asked a, uh, an Oscar winning movie producer if I could shadow him on his next shoot, mm. which was a big deal. I just, I just met the guy. So it was like a really unreasonable request. And uh, I pitched Jack Canfield on writing a book together. And I know Jack Canfield, he's got to get a thousand pitches a year. Yeah, so yeah. I knew that. But he, the opportunity. Jack, Jack Canfield, he has um, sold more books than anybody in history. Is not that correct? In- yeah, that sounds right. Chicken Soup for the Soul series and Success Principles. Yeah. Um, but the opportunity came up and it felt right. And so I did it. It's like, even though this is Jack and this is crazy, I'm like, so there were four things I did at that event. And I realized later that I liked myself more because I took those risks because they felt true to me. Um, now, is, is that because, does that have anything to do with the outcome of those risks? I think the outcome is completely separate. They're two different conversations. Mm-hmm. Even if I get a no to all four of those things, mm-hmm. and I, I got a no from Jack, I got a no from the woman. Um, oh, I, I pitched someone I wanted to coach, someone I thought was amazing. I said, I really want to coach you. I got a no from her, and I got a yes from the producer. Mm-hmm. So I got one out of four. But I realized even if I get four no's, I feel good about myself because I did the right thing. I put it out there. I took a risk. I risked the rejection. If I get a yes, that's a bonus. But the real win is feeling good about ourselves because we didn't play small. So I'm not going to regret that conference. I'm not going to regret those four invitations. I would regret not making the invitations. Oh, that's cool. I love that a lot. I love that. Yeah. So yeah, I, like, like you know what? Yeah, man, I love what you're saying, dude. Because uh, one of the things I think I hate the most in life is the oh man, I wish I had the I oh, I wish I'd yeah I, like, wish I hate I'd walking done. away from situation. Like I wish I'd approached him. Right? Like I wish I had. I, like, right. I, I'm like oh god, dude, why didn't you? I hate that. Yeah, I hate I, that. I was once in a hotel, locked out of my room at midnight. And I went to the reception to get, get a new key and I recognized John Gray from Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. Yeah. He was just sitting there talking to friends by the fireplace and yeah. I'd actually been trying to track him down for six months to ask him for an endorsement for my book. Oh, wow. And here, here he is. And after five minutes of lurking and feeling like an idiot, I left. <laughs> He's stalker. Yeah, just kind of pacing I, back and forth. I left. Acting, I, like, acting like you're doing something else. Right. He's like I, waiting for a phone call or some shit. <laughs> I felt like such a jerk. So I left. And the third time I said to my girlfriend, I just walked away from John Gray. I can't believe I just walked away. I said it three times. Yeah. He finally said, well, go back out there. So at 1 a.m., I got dressed again, went back to the lobby. He's still there talking with friends. And I went up to him and I said, my name's David Wood. I'm a big fan. If I can support you in any way, I'd be happy to. And that led directly to me being nominated to the Transformational Leadership Council. So now, once or twice a year, I get to go and hang out with John Gray, Jack Canfield, Don Miguel Ruiz as a member. Uh, I haven't met him yet. But that all came through me taking a risk and daring. And so I'm the encouragement to take that risk, dare, and hey, maybe it doesn't work out the way you wanted it to, but you know that you did the right thing. Well, let's see if we can explore for fun, <clears throat> because it's all a game. <laughs> the, right, we're playing. The, yeah, that, you're damn right we are. The organics, I don't know if that's the right word, but whatever, the, 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 well, or the mechanics behind uh, why people don't take the dare. Like, okay, so let's just use your example, John Gray. Like, that's, that's synchronicity. The dude's sitting there in a hotel that you've been looking for for six years. Like, come on, that's life going here, spoon fed. Okay. All right, so, but what is it? Let's really break it down uh, as clearly as we can. Why didn't you go? Why were you pacing around? Why did you go, ah, no, no, and walk away? 
Right. What, you know what exactly were you afraid of? You know, uh, initially, the problem was finding my truth. Like, what was the truth? And the only truth I could find is, you're famous. Would you touch me and maybe someone that will rub off? Mm-hmm. Like, that's what was true for me. And I just couldn't see that going, going over very well. So, like, attributing power to him? Were you... A- yeah, I think I was, I was just starstruck. And Were you I, thinking about any scenario, like if I go talk to him, that something weird could happen? Oh, like, yeah. Well, firstly, he's talking with a bunch of friends. Okay, so, so, I, so I they're all going to hear you. So I have to go up and, and stand there and, and yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. do a, b- a bunch of seated people by the fireplace and interrupt them yes. and say I'm a fan. So I'm worried that he's going to uh, just blow me off or I'm going to feel like, like I made a fool of myself. Or something, something like that. But what gave me access to going up and speaking to him is realizing that I am a fan. I really admire what he's accomplished. And so I was happy to go up and just share that. And if that's all that happened, I, was, I let go of any kind of outcome that had to happen from it. And it, as it turned out, uh, one thing led to another. And I said, I've, I've got an email list. And I'd be happy to promote something if, if you'd like me to do that. And he said, what are you doing for lunch tomorrow? So yeah, I never right. imagined that could have come out of it. But I let go of, I let um, go of attachment mm, to the outcome. You, wait, you just said something. You said, I never imagined that something like that would come out of it. No. And, and I, not then, but I bet you do now. <laughs> well, you know, I, I play the long game in a lot of things. When people see someone successful, like I, I'm fortunate enough to have had a lot of success in my life, and people just think, well, everything I do must just, just work. No, my God, I do a thousand things that don't work out. I can make a hundred phone calls and only have one of them produce some kind of an outcome. Mm-hmm. So I think it's a, it's a I'm an actuary, I used to be an actuary, so I play with statistics and, and the odds, and I just think you've got to dare a hundred times sometimes for two or three of those things to pay off. Mm, That's yeah. the game you play. You can't wait for the ones that you know are going to work. You'll be waiting a long time. Yeah. Steve Chandler says that yes lives in the land of no. And, and your friend Byron Katie says that everybody could have everything they want if they were only willing to ask a thousand people. Right. So I can virtually guarantee that every person that is either watching this uh, video blog or listening to it in podcast form at some point in the next 24 hours will have the option of demonstrating daring or what would you call the opposite of that? Oh, we're playing small. Okay, great. So they'll have that option. Yeah. Right. Give them a little piece of advice. Like, like that'll have like what the, if you could just tell say, yeah. and it's even if it's something we've already said, I got it. I got it. Word. On your deathbed, are you going to look back on this moment and be glad you didn't go for it? That is a mic drop right there. I love that. Yeah. How, yeah, that's solid. How are you going to want to look back on this moment when you're on your deathbed? Yep. What's going to have you go, oh, yeah, I crushed that. Even if you didn't get what you wanted. Right. Did that? Oh, so you asked me what stopped me. Yeah. What stopped me? I think what stopped me from going up to John Gray is attachment to the outcome. I was attached that it had to, had to like produce something great. Mm. When I could let go and say, as long as I just speak to him and say, hello, that'll be a win. Then I was able to walk up to him. I'm writing down the, the power of not caring about getting what you want, which is a paradox. Right. If you can have the win be that you spoke, have Ooh. that be the win. Oh, okay. Let's say that. Please say that again. Yes. Have the win be that you spoke and that you said what you wanted you spoke to. Spoke with <laughs> There's so much freedom. That's, that's badass. Yeah. Like that's the success story. Yes. That's you the get, success then you run away and go, I asked him, I asked him. And your girlfriend says, well, what are you saying? You're like, oh shit, I don't remember. <laughs> oh, right. I, better, I have to go back because I, I got too excited because I just asked. <laughs> yeah. I didn't even key. stick around long enough to give him a chance to answer. I was just so happy that I, I you know. Yeah. So that's playing for real. Mm. Uh, that was my insight that when we are speaking our truth, that's the win. 
the bonus is, is some great results. Like the bonus is I get to be at the Transformational Leadership Council hanging out with these people. That's the bonus. The real win is I'm going to be me. And I want everyone listening to this to take a big step in the direction of being you. Take the risk. Maybe it doesn't go as, as well as you want it to. But you spoke up. That's, that is so beautiful. Uh, I could love that more. All right. Let's go to number three. Okay. Caring. More caring. Yeah. And again, just to put, remind everybody, what we're talking about right now are uh, you, you say that, you know, in order to really crush it in life, in, in, in life and work, the big, the big key is deeper connections. Three great ways of establishing deeper connections are, um, what's the word? I know truth, but it's like being more truth. More truth. More, okay, more. Say more. More yeah. truth, more daring. And now let's talk about more caring. Yeah. So as an Australian male, um, I think my way of approaching life was very uh, yang. If we talk about yin and yang, mm -hmm. you know, yin being the more feminine and still and yang being penetrating, making things happen in life. I was very yang. I would go and, and lean into any fear. I'm afraid of heights. So I paraglide, fly over the Himalayas solo. Uh, I'm afraid of, um, I'm afraid of abandonment. So I would go into open relationships and date a woman who's dating other men. I was like, let's, let's see how far I can push myself. Hmm. So that's the daring. And I'm all for that. But I found that there's a limit to how far that can take you. And if you're doing all truth and all daring, but you're not caring for your body, caring for your emotions and your psyche and knowing when to say, Hey, that's too much. I'm pushing myself too hard. I need to take a week off or I need to get out of this relationship. I don't need to be more daring in this. I need to be more caring. So there's the yin, the, the yang of going for it. And then the yin of knowing when to nurture your own body Mm. and your own relationships and even nurture your business and just take care of your systems and your taxes instead of going out there creating new wonderful things in the world. Mm. The, all of that together sounds quite relaxing, to be honest with you, um, even though it does take courage to articulate your truth and that's part of the daring, right? And taking the risk. But the thing is, you just took the sphere out of it in the daring part by saying that the, the uh, win is simply making the move and being yeah. the, and, and not like, and just, and letting the way, hey, if I get what I want, sweet. If I don't, I still want. Yeah, that's true. And the caring part is knowing when to not be daring. Okay. So the caring part is knowing, Oh, that's an interesting comment. The caring yeah. part is knowing when not to be daring. Yeah. Knowing yeah. when not to be daring. That's interesting. So, so how do you know? <laughs> I, I don't always know. In fact, in, the, in this one relationship I was in, I kept being daring. I was so daring. I even bought a ticket for my partner and her husband to go on a vacation. I was leaning into it, but my body couldn't take it. I wasn't sleeping. I was going into anxiety and depression. So I learned the hard way, hey, that was too much for you. You've got to know your limits. So I, I ended up getting out of that relationship. And, and now I'm a big fan of monogamy because it's just easier for my nervous system. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. That's so great. Yeah. And with paragliding, yeah. I wanted to be daring. So I, I went and got the training and I went and flew over the Himalayas. I went and flew in Colombia. And then I had a couple of accidents and I realized, okay, I have, I've had a hundred hours of flying. I think, I think I've done the daring thing. I'm going to take care of this body. And I'm going to stay on the ground. Oh, really? So you're done. I think so. It might change in another oh. 20 years, but I think for now, yeah. I'm like, I want to be caring and nurturing of the body. But at the time it was right for me to, to be daring and really go for it. And I touched the sky. Yeah, well, you know, you, you mentioned that, and I said, I'm glad you brought that up because I, and this is a little, we're shifting gears a little bit, which is, um, you know, you mentioned how uh, soaring 10,000 feet above the Himalayas, hanging from a piece of cloth changes the way you see things. So, so even though you, you're, 
as an expression of caring, as an act of caring, you're like, yeah, I think I'm, I'm good now. I think I'm done with that. Um, <clears throat> I've had a couple accidents. I want to take care of my body. Yeah. I'll give you an, an example. Uh, this morning, I was coaching a client who's wondering if he should buy a million dollar business. He's like, I, I think I want to buy it. And I don't think it's the time for him to be more daring right now. He's, he's got, um, uh, he's, he's building a house. He's just had his fourth child. He's got a, a company that's already breaking uh, record sales uh, every month. He's already got so much going on. I don't get the sense that it's time for him to take on more and be more daring. I want him to hire a personal assistant. I want him to get his routines going where he's meditating every morning by the river. Mm. That's what I want for him. So different stages of life. Well, so I'm, I'm going to ask a question from a playful devil's advocate perspective. Why, um, what if I, what if I was the you in the um, David Gray example where he's having the chat, you know, with some friends around and I wanted to communicate with him and I was afraid to, what would you say to me if I said, um, like you're my buddy, you're nearby. I walk away and you say, well, did you talk to him? I said, no. And, and you said, well, why the hell not? And I said, well, because I, um, I'm caring for myself. I don't think that this is the time to be daring. I'm just caring for myself because it, may, it gave me anxiety. So I'm caring for myself. So to I, would, myself. I, would, I would say if you've approached four John Grays this month and you really feel like it's just time to stop pushing, then sure, I buy it. Okay. But so, okay. if you're just doing it because you're yeah. because you're scared, you're scared, then I yeah. then I call yeah, right I call, <laughs> I call bullshit. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. I don't know that it's going to be that caring for you to not just go up and share with someone that you're a fan and you admire his work. Right. Like that's probably yeah. So right on. yeah. Talk about the uh, but but going back to the soaring ten thousand feet over the Himalayas. That must be a pretty mm -hmm. spectacular thing. Um, well, you said it has you. I can't remember exactly. I said it a minute ago, but it gives you a different perspective where. Uh, yeah, you see, life you see, life, see life differently. Well, it, it's an amazing thing to step off a mountain and go up. Wow. Like that, that's, a, that's a crazy experience. And I went up to 10,000 feet above sea level under a storm cloud. And one of my biggest insights from, from flying and that experience was why the hell was I doing this alone? And without guidance, because there must have been. You were doing. You were in. You were hang gliding in the Himalayas alone. Yeah, I was solo, oh, yeah. and I had left the group, and I didn't have an instructor. I was at the point where I was allowed to go without an instructor. Okay. Um, so I had a radio, but no one to talk to on the radio. Mm -hmm. And there must have been fifteen decision points where I was wondering, "Will this kill me?" Wow. Like, can I go over there or is that a stupid move? I really wasn't sure. And I realized later there was no hero story in doing that alone. Mm. There was no profit in it. Mm. I could have had a guide while I was doing that to say, hey, you're doing great. Or yeah, don't go over there. You really want to think twice about that. I could have had that guide and had so much more fun and had a, a, a much better predicted outcome like better chance of living if i'd had a guide so what was the belief operating within you at the moment when you decided to do it solo that that would be better like what were you trying to prove i don't know that i was trying to do it alone it was just that i did do it alone um because i love a lot of people were so i'm like well other people are doing it alone i'll do it alone it wasn't until I was up there after 20 decision points that I realized this is crazy. I could just have a guide on the phone. Yeah. So I realized I'm a coach and I believe in coaching. Why would I, um, <laughs> why would I go and do this alone That's when I can have funny. a coach with me supporting me through it? So now I have a coach and in Columbia, I, I did have an instructor on the, uh, on the line. Okay. <laughs> We only have a few more minutes left. There's a lot more I wanted to ask you about, though. Um, we may have to have a, 
a, a, a round of two. We might need a round two. I yeah. We might need a round two. But tell me about the month you spent with Byron Katie. Uh, she has, has something called Turnaround House, where you go and, and you share a house with 10 people. You live in very close quarters, and it brings up every thought, every painful thought or belief you, you can imagine. And we did the work every day. And she'd come and sit with us for uh, maybe an hour or two on most days and just kind of dig a bit deeper. It's a wonderful experience to be with. For a uh, month. My favorite teacher. Yeah. That was a month. <coughs> Excuse yeah. me. You're, so you're cohabitating with 10 other people, nine strangers? Yep, strangers. Th two of the guys that I was in a room with had anger management issues, and one of them threatened to kill me. Oh, and, lovely. And I, I think he could have done it too. But I had so many breakthroughs because Katie says, the worst thing that can happen to you is a thought. And I believe now that any suffering I have and any suffering my clients have is not due to the circumstances. That's not what causes suffering. It's what we're believing. So I'm passionate about diving in there with my clients and helping them see what are they believing that's hurting them and busting that open so that they can have more peace and enjoyment. Yeah, well, that's, so that's something that I think we should uh, elaborate upon in our, in our uh, episode two, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to. Right on. You also mentioned in an email exchange, and we don't have time to get into this, so we'll put this also on the agenda for session two, um, that you have your own personal experience with anxiety and depression. And that's something that's very important and dear to my heart. Um, I have spent a lot of time, I used to be a licensed therapist. I also was a clinical social worker and spent a lot of time, a lot of my professional life working with people who uh, experience anxiety and depression. I also have a really, really strong opinion about the corrupt the corruption of big pharma and how many people in this world are over medicated. And uh, so I, is that something that you're willing to talk about? Can we put that on the uh, yeah. agenda for session two? Yeah, I'd love to. I, it really knocked me on my ass when I, when I got anxiety and depression, because I thought I could handle anything and I could handle it spiritually and, and through diet and exercise. And I've been challenged for 20 years with the ups and downs, and I've learned how to make my peace with it and how to how to live with it. So I'd be, I'd be oh, okay. Uh, yeah, please let's do that if you're willing. Yeah, yeah. Is yeah. that a, is that a promise? Yes, that's a promise. Uh, so I like that that little pause right there. Right. Yep. I asked you, are, can you give me your word? And you you closed your eyes, you looked up, and then you said yes. Yep. So that I can so I can tell by your body language that's a mindful yes. Yeah. Am I willing to commit to that? Yes. Yeah, you pause. You said, yeah, that's great. There you go. Nice. Yeah. Good modeling right there, dude. Way to walk yeah. and talk. <laughs> yeah. So I know, I know we've, got to, we've got to wrap this up. Can I make an offer to, to your listeners? Uh, please do. Yeah, I would, you know, if you are committed to change, you love a lot of your life, and you want to know how can you be playing better in life and business, then I'd love to chat with you. And what I do is I offer a, uh, a session, goes for about 45 minutes with people who qualify. And uh, here's how you qualify. You've got to be, have a track record of success in business. So you're probably making at least $200,000 a year. Um, and you're, you're, you're action oriented. You like taking action in service of getting to where you want to be. And if you want to do a planning session with me, I'm happy to do it. I don't charge for it. It's because this is how I find the right people to work with long term. And if you want to take the plan and implement it yourself, do it with my blessing. Let me know how it goes. And if you love the plan and you want support in implementing it, then we can talk about working together. That's uh, incredibly generous. And that, that's beautiful. So, and then how do they reach you? Just go to the website, playforreal.life. Playforreal.life. Play yep. Life. Yeah, dot life with an F. Yeah, that's uh, Play for real dot life. Go there and click on request a session, and I'd love to chat with you. And we can so so they'll go to Play for Life, request a session, and they just say, "Hey, I heard you on Chris Doris's Tough Talks." Play for real dot life, and yeah, mention Play in the real. comments that you that you uh, okay. That's heard great. About them here. That's beautiful. Well, thank you for that. Yeah, my pleasure. And thank you for time and and for this was really fun, man. I mean, it was powerful and fun which yeah. I think is a badass combo platter. Yes, thank you. Um, someone once, once 
said that the work I do, uh, or actually they introduced me as deep and playful. And I thought, <laughs> what a great combination. I, I, I things me. Let's play yeah, that. Right on, dude. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you so much. So, uh, David Wood, appreciate you, man. We'll, we will, con to be continued. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. All right. Okay. Take care.